Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are we doing today? So, a couple things. Um, I just want to say that um, this week is unit five. The short, it should be a shorter unit. Um, French Revolution is not too difficult, um, but I'm not doing any additional work other than the, the watch the video and do the reading because coming up you have two big assignments first off your dbq which i know some of you are already working on um or hopefully you've you've started already working on that is due on thursday must be typed must be submitted on google classroom um all the instructions are, are listed for you then after that you have a practice exam number two okay and that one is just to see where we're at by now you we've covered units one through five we only have two more units left before the ap exam in two weeks three weeks um so i just want to see exactly where we're at and what areas we might need help on um other than that there is no i can't think of anything else anyway do your cast we're all you know cast is due may 15th couple days after the AP exam just saying anyway okay if you oh I know what uh, Wednesday's afternoon zoom session is optional if you have questions about dbqing or on unit five come to it it'll be at two o'clock only I'm not doing a, a separate one at three I'm just doing two o'clock only for anybody that wants to get on on zoom and ask me some questions it uh, again it is optional if you don't have any questions, don't worry about coming on. Um, anyway, if you if you need me for anything, just let me know. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Unit five is mainly, of course, the French Revolution and Napoleon. But before we get to that, we have to talk about the social and economic changes that will lead up to the French Revolution. And of course, we're talking about the commercial revolution when, when dealing with economics. And a part of the commercial revolution is the agricultural revolution now yes we've talked about these in other units briefly but we're going to go into a little bit more detail now so that you have a full understanding of uh, of it so um, when the scientific revolution occurred people are going to use the scientific method and scientific theories and thoughts um, to better the food supply try to grow more food than what they have and that's called scientific agriculture or also called the agricultural revolution. So by using the scientific method, they're going to start realizing that um, they could grow more food with less land, okay? And there's certain ways that they're gonna do that, okay? Um, and of course, it's gonna really start in the low countries and England areas where there's a small amount of farmable land, okay? So you have to use your land as best that you can. So in the low countries, you're going to see um, they're moving from an open field concept to closed field concept called enclosure movement, um, which is where you're going to use fences to um, to to surround like the best land that you have, and and the stuff that you grow within that those fences are going to be the the crops that you sell on the market. Everything outside the fences would be for local markets or for your own consumption. Okay, so we're and, and because of the enclosure movement, we're going to have a rise of a new social group called the gentry, who, who are your landowning elites. They're going to make lots of money through the enclosure movement, through the enclosure fields. Okay, because they're going to now focus on growing massive amount of food to sell in the markets and make lots of money. Also, to help with uh, food production, you're going to have crop rotation, which is where you rearrange the crops every every um, every um, season also you you include crops that are going to be um, bring nutrients back into the soil and that was created by jo uh, Charles turn of Townsend uh, then of course the use of fertilizer okay people are going to start realizing that you can use fertilizer and which is basically animal poop and yes I know another video by Caden or whoever was doing it will probably be created because I said poop but anyway, uh, fertilizer will be will be uh, used to again simulate the, the the land to put more nutrients in the soil. Okay, 
and of course some new inventions during this time period the Jethro Hotel the seed drill plant so planting seeds in a more efficient manner uh, Thomas Newcomb N-E-W-C-O-M-E-N he created the first steam engine and then James Watts W-A-T-T-S will perfect the steam engine okay so all these people will will be a part of your agricultural revolution which helps to bring more food to the people the cultural revolution brought a lot of social changes okay um not just because of food but food was a major part of it but also for other reasons we're when you're talking about the 18th century uh we're, we're going to see a massive population increase of about 120 million people of course when dealing with food we're talking about really the most important food product that comes to the plate of most or most um europeans and that's the potato okay the potato will be used as a, as a, a major component of meals for the poor the middle class etc and the agricultural revolution is going to allow for lot more more amounts of food to be to be produced okay now when, when dealing with the diets of the of people we are talking about okay bread is still the main part of the meal bread and potatoes are the main parts of the meal you have peas and beans for the lower classes as well meats and eggs were really for just like special occasions like christmas easter you know some special occasion uh everyone drank like wine and beer um you really didn't drink water because most of the places where people lived the water was polluted because they lived in the cities um only babies would drink milk because the idea of drinking milk was obscene it was considered unnatural and unhealthy other than for babies um and but when you talk about the upper class their diets were a lot different the upper class you had lots of meat lots of fish and cheese and sweets and you you name it okay very little vegetables very little fruit because the idea of why wow, you're eating fruits and vegetables that's peasant food you got to eat meat because if you eat meat then you're, you're you're showing your wealth okay um of course other other reasons beyond food would be that you know um now there's going to be professional armies instead of every man just fighting now you're going to have professional armies fighting in wars so you have less people dying you have transportation with the steam with the steam engine and other forms of transportation you're starting to see people moving from one location to another in search of, of food um people's life expectancy is they are rising but you still have to understand the infant mortality rate is still 50 percent so you have a good chance you have a 50 50 chance of of your child dying okay after a few weeks of being born okay diseases are still pretty big and there's really no medical advancements when it comes to like you know curing diseases or anything like that with social changes we have to talk about marriage and um the role of women okay uh in marriage for example the lower classes are not going to marry because they have to but a lot of times it's going to be um because they want to not always but but you know usually it's about love men cannot marry until they could actually support their family so usually by the by their mid-20s when they have some kind of skill some kind of trade that's when they marry um the cottage industry is going to be is going to be implemented and used often as well as the um the putting out system in uh the cottage industry is going to be mainly in the cities whereas the putting out system is mainly going to be in the rural areas okay this is a way to to make money during the off season when growing isn't occurring um women of course stayed home you know unmarried women were able to work in the factories maybe at, well actually there's not too many factories yet but they're going to be able to work outside outside the home until they're married once they're married their their job is to be at home uh the nuclear family is very common in the 1700s meaning uh instead of having your extended family in your home you're talking about having just you know you your wife and your kids not your grandparents not your parents not your aunts and uncles no that's pretty much gone um 
witchcraft is declines. We talked about witchcraft last unit as well. Okay. When we're looking at political changes in Europe, you know, the two major political powers in Europe would be England and France, but they're at totally opposite ends of the spectrum. England at this point has a constitutional monarchy. They have now surpassed the Dutch as the leaders of trade, leaders of banking. Okay. Um, and of course, with their empire in the Americas, in India, in other areas of the world, they are now the number one producer of goods in the world. You know, besides though they have a constitutional monarchy, they are very dis they have a very distinct social class system of the upper, middle, and lower classes. That never ch that doesn't change at least not for now. Um, the, they do because of the war of Spanish succession. They control the slave trade, um, but remember by the 1830s, slavery is going to be abolished in the British Empire. Now in France, on the other hand, it's a totally opposite. By this point, you have Louis the Fifteenth, who is a very weak ruler. He and he, you know, he's the great great, or he's a great grandson of Louis the Fourteenth, um, and he was not destined to rule. So he, um, and unfortunately for him, he never really had a way to train to rule because he, he when his great grandfather dies, he's still a young boy, and he doesn't have the potential or the characteristics of having a of being a good absolute ruler so he's um, and during louis the 15th reign this is where um, he's going to spend large amounts of money that france did not have okay um, such as giving large amounts of money to the american colonies to fight in the american revolution also the nobles are going to take advantage of having a weak king um, so really france is on the decline and England's on the incline. Even with the American Revolution, England still is the dominant factor in all of Europe. So let's talk about what's leading up to the French Revolution. Of course, we know that we have incompetent rulers, Louis the 15th and Louis the 16th, both very incompetent leading up to the French Revolution, but there's a plethora of reasons why the revolution is going to occur. And most of these problems are not going to be addressed. First off, the peasants are angry. They're upset. The peasants make up about four fifths of the population of France. So they make up a majority. They're upset because there's not enough food. They pay an exorbitant amount of taxes and they have no, no political power whatsoever, even though they make up like 97% of the population. Um, See, there's a lack of food in France right now because of a of bad harvest. So food prices are going up. Um, there is also uh, a huge debt right now in France. That's mainly because of Louis XIV and his extravagant lifestyle and wars, along with Louis the Louis the Fifteenth's pension for giving out money to the American colonists. Okay, so that's why some French historians are like, blame America, blame America, blame America for the French Revolution. Um, and um, the nobles are also wanting more power. They figured Louis XV and Louis XVI were both incompetent, so they could try, maybe this is the time that they could gain some power. Of course, we know Louis XVI is not very popular, but neither is his wife, Marie Antoinette. And we, of course, talked a lot about that. Um, now, even though France was fairly bankrupt, um, the nobles refused to pay taxes. They did not want to pay any more taxes. They said, you know, the poor are the burden of society, so they should pay the most taxes. So that was very, you know, so even though they had all the money, they refused to pay taxes. Sound familiar? Anyway, um, the, the monarchies and the government altogether was basically really unpopular by all sectors of society. Okay, the government was hated for being inefficient, ineffective, and irresponsible. Inflation for prices were going through the roof. Okay, uh, inflation of food in particular was skyrocketing. And um, there's just a major divide between those with money and those without. 
97% of the population had no money or very little money. 3% of the population, which includes the clergy, lived the good life. Here's a quick visual of the Estates General, basically how the country was divided up. 1% would be the clergy, 2% the nobility, and 97% being the third estate. Out of that 97%, about 80% of them would be your peasantry, okay, which had absolutely no rights and they paid the most taxes. Now, leading up to the French Revolution, um, Louis the Sixteenth realizes he needs to do something. So he's going to call the SH general for the first time in over 175 years. Okay. And the thing is, is that what, how do we work this? No one's alive to have seen it in action. Um, so what happens? Okay. Well, one of the first things the king does is, you know, since he hears everyone complaining, he says, okay, everyone create a list of your, of your grievances. Okay, and I'm going to look at them and see if I can address them. They're called the Cayers de Deliances, which I know those of you in French are cringing right now ah, of, of my French, but that's okay. Um, and it's going to uh, it's going to have a list of each of the three estates and their grievances that they have to the king, but the king really does nothing with them. Okay, just collects it and really just throws it aside. Um, so when the French Revolution actually starts occurring, you're going to uh, it occurs after the the third estate is locked out of their meeting room by the king, and really that third estate is going to lead the revolution. So one key tip when studying Unit Five, okay, the French Revolution is extremely important, of course. It's, it's really a turning point in history. It really mo moves Europe away from the old system, the old system and, and brings it back or brings it into the modern times. But when you're, when you're looking at the French Revolution, understand just, we go from a monarchy to a republic, to a, an oligarchy, to an absolute ruler, okay? You don't need to know every single event, every single detail, but just like what you see on this slide, just kind of understand the natural rhythm and the stages of the revolution. I'm not going to go over every detail. You don't need to know every detail. You just need to know the major concepts, the major, you know, the major events, maybe um, just the major ideas, not, not every single detail. Because so, um, in the first phase of the revolution is your moderate phase. This is where basically the bourgeoisie um, are really going to take the heat, take the 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 lead. I guess you, I, I mean to say. Um, now, after they get locked out of their meeting room, they they're going to do the tennis court oath and they're going to create their constitution, the national assembly, blah blah blah. And then after that, then we move to the reign of terror, where basically. The king is going to be killed off, um, and you have Robespierre becoming the leader of the National Convention, and um, and then we have the Reign of Terror, and then from that point on, then you have um, the Directory, where it's, it's it's considered the conservative phase, where it's run by five individuals that represent the middle class, okay, um, and then from that point onward, then it, then you have the Napoleon era. OK, even though he's um, considered a first a ruler and then he becomes an emperor. So the start of the French Revolution is really the swearing of the tennis court oath by the third estate, which now becomes the National Assembly. They call themselves the National Assembly because they say they represent the state. They represent the nation. Okay, the tennis court oath basically said that they will never disband, this National Assembly will never disband until a constitution is written. Okay, um, this really marks the, the first part of the French Revolution, the start of the French Revolution. Now, you know, if you remember, the, um, you had the three estates, they were fighting over the voting plan, they could fight an event, or they could decide 
how, how to vote in the estates general. That's when the third estate gets locked out and they create the tennis court oath. Now, um, now, so you're going to have uh, the National Assembly. Um, they're going to, one of the first things they do after hearing rumors, okay, members of the National Assembly and really more, more of the followers of it within Paris are going to hear these bad rumors about, um, about army members going to Paris to protect the king and that they're willing to kill citizens if, if, if the king is, um, you know, touched. And so the people of Paris are going to storm the Bastille prison, which is this massive edifice in the middle of Paris. Um, and they store, they're looking for gunpowder, guns, and anything to defend themselves. Okay. I, this was, a, the Bastille was a symbol of the royalty, this massive edifice that was, you know, whether it was true or false or, you know, whatever, um, there were stories about what happened in the Bastille by the monarchy, by the government, and the mob of people, mob mentality is always bad, but the mob of people felt that it, it was it was their need to destroy this Bastille before any more progress occurs. When the storming of the Bastille, uh, when word gets out of the storming of the Bastille, when that word gets to the countryside, you're gonna have a you're gonna have what's called a great fear occur, which is very similar. The the peasants of the countryside are gonna are going to um, start storming the manor houses of the, of the upper class, okay? Very similar to the Bastille, and they're going to go ahead and run the nobles away, okay? A lot of them will leave France for their protection. Um, this is called the Great Fear. So you have not just chaos in Paris, but now you're having chaos throughout France, okay? Um, Eventually, the National Assembly will create a constitution called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which basically say all men are born free. They have equal rights, natural rights that cannot cannot be taken away. Um, it is basically uh, a carbon copy of of um, the U.S. Constitution. Okay, women get very little in this. Okay, but they will ha they will have some. Uh, eventually, because of the price of bread, a uh, large amount of peasant women are going to march to Versailles to bring the nobles back to Paris. Uh, and this will be the last time that um, the, no the not nobles, excuse me, the monarchy, the king and queen, this will be the last time that they ever are at Versailles. They're going to be pretty much held capture in Paris. As you have the Bastille, you have the Great Fear, you have, um, you're starting to see the monarchy as really ineffective and untrustworthy. Um, you're starting to get a little more radical. Okay. For example, in August of 1790, the, civ the civil constitution of the clergy is signed that basically put the clergy at the control of the revolution of the revolution. So basically they are no longer an independent entity. They are now in control of, or they are being controlled by the revolutionary leaders. Now, um, the clergy, a lot of the land is going to be taken away um, so that they could sell the land and use that money to fund the revolution. That land is called the Asignat, okay, or, or this new currency based off the church land is called the Asignat, okay. Um, and the clergy have to swear allegiance to the revolution. And if not, they're going to get sent to prison. Okay. Of course, the Pope basically is condemning this because they say, um, the, the Pope basically says the clergy have, has one allegiance and that's to God, not to a revolution. And this actually, the civil constitution of the clergy is one of the more, more negative aspects of the revolution, the least popular one. Because um, many people are like, whoa, this is kind of weird. Just don't mess with the religion. Okay. Well, the National Assembly is going to go away and the, and the Legislative Assembly is formed. And this is where we get the terms right, center, left, when it deals with politics. Uh, the Jacobins, basically, uh, they, are your, they are sitting on your, on your left side of the room. Uh, they want to overthrow the monarchy, get rid of the king, create a republic. 
Um, they're led by um, Maximilian Robespierre. Okay. Other people that are in the Jacobins are Marat. Okay. Marat is this uh, writer of the day, and he's causing more people to, to join the revolution by, by a lot of, uh, of his um, libel uh, writings. In the century of the Girondists, they basically wanted a war with um, the countries outside of France, because at this point, Austria and Prussia and other countries are saying, stop the revolution or we're going to we're going to take care of you. The Jacobins were kind of against going to war with Prussia in particular. At, um, but the Girondists, led by George Danton, was like, yeah, go for war. We we could do this. We got we got motivation on, on our side. OK, both the Jacobins and the Girondists really occupy the left side of this room. The right hand side are your more moderates and those that were still loyal to the monarchy. But those, the people on the right side were starting to become less and less. Their numbers were becoming less and less. In um, June of, of uh, 1791, the king and the queen tried to escape, but that fails. And um, when they're brought back, they're pretty much in prison now. Um, and but when Austria and Prussia find finds out about this, they they do the Declaration of Pilnitz in August of 1791, which basically says, if you dare touch the king, uh, we will we will invade France and stop the revolution. Okay. Um, also in the Declaration, it says, end the revolution, put the monarchy back. Or else, in reality, Prussia didn't care about the about the Bourbons. No one really cared about the Bourbons other than Austria because uh, Marie Antoinette was Austrian. Okay, but it was this idea about a revolution by the people overthrowing the government. Okay, and the rest of Europe did not like that. We, they saw it in England. Now they're seeing it in France. And you know what? what Europe is going to find out when France sneezes, the rest of Europe gets sick, but they didn't know that yet. They just knew that revolution by the people would be bad. Okay. Now, now we start getting very radical. You have a group of people in Paris, the most radical called the saint Coulet. They're starting to get more powerful. They're going to take to the streets and uh, force the legislative assembly to eliminate the king. Eventually, the legislative assembly is going to be uh, uh, got rid of, and in its place will be the national convention. The saint Coulet basically called for a new democratic a democratic body, okay, which was going to be the national convention, uh, it, and it, they wanted a pure democracy which is extremely radical. Remember, there's no pure democracies in this world in, in modern in the modern times. Well, um, and they, they will eventually get something similar to that called the National Convention. OK, uh, but before that happens in September uh, of 1792, uh, you start having the prisons getting filled and filled with nobles, priests, anybody that was against the revolution. OK. And so the revolutionary leaders are going to be like, whoa, we need to do something with all these people because if Prussia or Austria uh, enter France, they could just open up the prisons and you're going to have thousands upon thousands of people that are naturally against the revolution. So you're going to have what's called the September Massacre, okay, mainly done by saint Coulet, but also lots of other people that are very pro-revolution. They're going to go into the prisons and totally eliminate, without trials, without anything, all the people. So we're talking about men, women, children, priests, you name it, anybody that's in, that's in a prison. Okay, maybe not children, but men, women, priests, anybody that was not for the revolution, they're going to kill. Hence the reason it's called September Massacre. So you, um, now, um, after that occurs, that now the idea is that we... The National Convention is only people that are totally 100% for the revolution. And in the National Convention, they want to abolish the monarchy, uh, execute the king, 
But the gerundists, though, are like, whoa, 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 whoa. We need to kind of chill. We could let's imprison Louis, okay? But we don't want to kill the king. That would that would set a bad precedent, okay? The Jacobins though wanted his death. When the National Convention finally does vote on what to do with the king, by one vote again, by one vote, they decide to kill the king, okay? Just like you saw something similar like that in England, okay? Well. After the king is killed, um, the Jacobins and the saint who, who are now in the National Convention, are like, the Girondists are not radical enough, so they start ousting the, the Girondists, okay, and killing off the leaders of the Girondists, who were once their allies. Now, the Girondists, like George Danton and others, are going to be ousted and eliminated, killed off by the, by the National Razor, the guillotine, and now the country is being run by Maximilien Robespierre, the saint Coulé, and the rest of the Jacobins. Now, Edmund Burke, who was a very famous conservative writer during this time period, uh, he was a British conservative who basically said mob mentality will never be successful. And he's saying the French Revolution is now basically just mob mentality. Okay. And that mob mentality will eventually lead to anarchy. And the only way to get rid of anarchy is having a strong absolute ruler, like a military dictatorship, a military leader. And you know what? Edmund Burke was correct because he's going to say, he's going to predict the future. Because who's that military dictator? Napoleon. So, you have, after the Declaration of Hillenus was signed, you have the first coalition um, of countries that are starting to attack France. First coalition would be pretty much all the major countries of Europe because, again, they're not, they don't care much about the Bourbon family, but they just care about a revolution happening in their country. So, they're all coming together to oppose the French people. And when this occurs, um, the idea of, of having a group of, of people ruling the country to stop this first coalition is, is formed. And this, this group of people will be called the Committee of Public Safety. They are created to stop the influx of all these new invaders coming into France. So now, pretty much at this point, you have the Republic of Virtue, which, execu which executes the queen, executes the thousands and thousands of people that are not necessarily 100% for the revolution. Uh, they start de-Christianizing France. Okay, they issue the Lev en masse, which is going to be where every male between the ages of 18 and 40 are going to be forced to join the military. Now, this military that's good, you know, that is going to form is going to be led by a little guy by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. You might have heard of him. And he will lead this military of pretty much any man between the ages of 18 and 40, whether they have a gun, a stick, a, rocks, knives, doesn't matter. They're going to be a part of the military. They're going to be able to defeat the first coalition and keep them out of France. Now, this... Um, this new government under the reign of terror, <coughs> excuse me, create, uh, under Robespierre, of course, being the leader, creates a law of the maximum, which basically says that uh, it, it, it's total war against anybody and everybody. What that means is if you're not 100% with the revolution or you're part of this other faction of countries that are against France, you are going to die. That's called the law of the maximum. Now, unfortunately, Maximilian Robespierre goes a little too crazy with his ideas, um, and eventually he's going to be arrested by the revolution itself, um, and then he gets executed, um, which ends the reign of terror for, for the French Revolution. Okay, this, uh, because of his, 
he was too radical because he started going a little crazy. <coughs> um, people just started realizing enough was enough. Now, the third phase of the revolution is a thermidorian reaction, which not much is happens here. You have what's called the, the directory that's formed, which is a group of people, an, an executive branch and a legislative branch. It's all led by five bourgeoisie men. Eventually, though, you know, their goal was to stop the radicalness, bring calm back to France. But by 1799, most people hated the directory and they called for a revol another revolution or a coup d'etat. And that is what happens when Napoleon comes to power. In, in November 1799, he overthrows the directory with the help of the military. Um, and the, the third phase of the revolution is done. So you may ask yourself, what do we need to know about the revolution? There are, there are several results of the revolution that you definitely need to know. First off, the revolution is going to get rid of the ancient regime or the old regime class system. It's going to replace it with... Um, laws based on equality and ability. Whereas in the past, upper class people had, had more rights than lower class. Now that goes away, which is a very enlightened idea. Okay, there's going to be laws that every that's that's it's the same law for everyone. There's going to be equality no matter what um, social class you're at. Okay, it's going to be a capitalistic society. It's going to be a secular government, meaning now the church is going to, the church as of right now is not part of France. It is going to bring really the, the new French government that's formed is going to be the foundation of modern states to come. And overall, with the revolution over, there is light at the end of the tunnel for the people of France, where now they're seeing hope that stability and greatness will come back to France. These are your reasons or these are your uh, results of the revolution. Now, when, when we think of uh, Napoleon, we think of a great military hero, and he was. But for AP Euro, we have to look at his accomplishments as a leader and how he changed political, economic, and social institutions in Europe. So Napoleon, uh, when he has his coup d'etat in 1799, um, he's going to rule as the first council from 1799 to 1804. And then he's going to turn into an emperor in 1804 when he rules from 1804 to 1815. Now, Napoleon is considered a great ruler because he brought stability back to France. Very popular and um, some people even consider him an enlightened despot because he's going to destroy democracy by using democracy by securing power for life, which is a very enlightened despot thing. So again, destroy democracy by using democracy by securing power for life. Okay, because what he's going to do is he is going to basically say, hey, you guys love me so much. Why don't you vote for me to be an emperor for life? And so he's using democracy to eliminate democracy, which actually worked. Again, a very enlightened despot type of thing. But some things that we need to definitely understand with Napoleon is that Napoleonic Code uh, was created not just in France, but as he starts taking over all countries in Europe. He's going to instill the Napoleonic Code, which means it's one uniform set of laws for the entire area. It's not just local laws, but now like basically federal laws. And it's and it's one of the biggest things is it states that it's equality before the law. Something that guess who Voltaire mentioned and was all for. He uh, also in the Napoleonic Code it called for religious freedom. It called for property rights. And a whole bunch of other rights and again we're talking we're talking about men only now 
Napoleon wanted to ensure his legitimacy, so he wanted to get the church to support him. So he created what's called the Concordat of 1801, which, bas which basically said that um, since the Napoleon needed the church to be a true ruler, a true ruler, and the church wanted to get back into France, they both needed each other. So the Concordat of 1801 basically said that, that the church accepts the losses of land and the new government in France and that basically the Roman Catholic Church is going to be the majority religion of France. What that means is it's not the official religion, but it's the, the, the religion of the majority of people. Okay, France does not have an official religion and it, and it still doesn't. But most of the people are actually Roman Catholic. Okay. Now, what's going to happen? He's going to start taking over large amounts of land throughout Europe. Okay. Such as the HRE. He, he's, he finally eliminates the HRE and creates what's called the Confederation of the Rhine. And he starts taking over all areas of Europe. And as he does that, he's going to put family members on the throne to, to so that he has all power throughout Europe. And literally, ev almost every part of Europe will be either allied with Napoleon or controlled by Napoleon, with one exception, and that is England. Now, other things that Napoleon did, he, he brought financial stability to France by, I know it's kind of weird, but he actually said that a government needs a balanced budget. They cannot spend more money than they take in in taxes and such. I know that's a weird thought in today's world, but whatever. He created a national bank. And this national bank is going to be not just the bank of the country, but also this is where your national economists are. They're the ones that basically will, will write the, any economic laws about taxes, about uh, spending, about anything. Anything that does that deals with finance, they handle because Napoleon said, let the experts handle the finances and that'll get us out of debt. Okay, which actually worked. Okay, he granted peasants freedom, not just in France, but in all areas that he conquered. He eliminated serfdom and the ancient regime in every area he conquered. Napoleon, um, one of the biggest negatives that he does though is he creates a nationalistic idea in the areas he conquered because he is going to force everyone in these areas like in Germany and Italy and other areas to learn French culture before learning the local culture. And that's going to anger a lot of people because everyone's like, hey, I want to learn my culture, my, you know, my German language, my German culture first. And that's going to be a big no-no under Napoleon. Of course, all good things come to an end. And for Napoleon, his big ego was too massive for his little body. Now, at this point, Napoleon controlled all of Europe with the exception of the United Kingdom. Most people would have been fine with, with controlling all of Europe, except for the United Kingdom, but not Napoleon. Since he could not defeat them militarily, he's going to try to starve them out by creating what's called the Continental System. This was an economic weaponry or economic weapon against Great Britain and the United Kingdom. He told all of Europe, you cannot trade with England. And that angers large amounts of people, large amounts of countries in Europe, because one of the biggest trading partners is going to be England. So now they can't send their, their natural resources, their wood, their flour, their whatever to England. And that's going to anger the people. Russia says, nope, we're not, we're not going to listen to you. Portugal says, we're not going to listen to you. And then, of course, now when Napoleon is told no, when somebody says no to Napoleon, he gets angry. So he decides we're going to, we're going to start off with, with Portugal, take care of Portugal first. So he asked the king of, of Spain to go through Spain to get to Portugal. The king of Spain says no. Well, then Napoleon, who was way too powerful for uh, the, the French military was way too powerful than the Spanish military. Um, 
Napoleon is going to basically forcefully remove the Spanish king and put his brother on the throne, which then allows the, the French troops to go through Spain to get to Portugal. But the problem is in 1808, the Spanish people rebelled as, as the French were going through Spain. And they started attacking. And this war is going to last for about five years, killing over 300,000 French soldiers. A war where it's the people that had very few weapon, you know, very little weaponry. They had uh, a lot of stones and uh, knives and some guns, but they were able to hold off the, the French military. Well, Napoleon had enough of the fighting. And he, he calls for all his people to come back because he has a grand a grander plan, okay, and that is going to invade Russia, okay. Since the Tsar Alexander opposed the continental system, Napoleon's like, well, you know what, it's Russia, we we could easily beat Russia. So he um, he was so confident that really his soldiers were not ready for the the long battle in the cold. Uh, winters of Russia. So, um, but the, the Russians knew that the French military was too strong for them. So instead of fighting them at the border, like most other countries would have, <coughs> the Russians went into their country closer to Moscow to meet up with Napoleon. And when Napoleon gets to Ru the Russian border, Napoleon's dumbfounded because he, he expected the fight but instead he goes inward finding no supplies no food no shelter anywhere he goes his soldiers are literally dying from fro uh, being uh, you know frostbitten fr uh, hunger a lot of them will will leave because they're just they're just they had enough and by the time Napoleon and his troops get to Moscow it's sneak attack time the Russians that start attacking a very weak French military and the French military are going to be forced to turn around and go back out of the 500,000 troops, less than five or, or less than 50 or 60,000 actually make it up or make it back to Paris. That was, that was the French military decimated. That was the first Napoleonic battle on land. That Napoleon, that Napoleon lost. Now that it looks like Napoleon is very weak, the Grand Alliance is going to be formed, which is basically the UK, Russia, Prussia, Austria, all the major powers of Europe. They decide that they're going to band together and once and for all defeat Napoleon now that he's weak. And they do. And they do defeat Napoleon in the Battle of the Nations in October of 1813. But what do you do with little man? Okay, he's a national hero. If you execute him, the people will revolt. If you let him go free, he'll cause another revolution to come back to power. So what, what the Grand Alliance basically does is puts him in forced retirement where Napoleon is going to live off the coast of Italy in a very moderately climate or in a very moderate climate um, where he also gets a pension, a mansion, servants, you name it. But that wasn't good enough for him. Okay, he's going to leave the island of Elba, go back to, to France and try to rule again in June of eight, in in, uh, excuse me, in 1815. Okay, finally, what's going to happen in, after 100 days of rule? And of course, the Grand Alliance is like, no, no, we're not having this. They attack France again, Napoleon, and in the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon loses, and Napoleon gets sent packing once again, but this time to the middle of nowhere in an island called St. Helena. And Napoleon is never seen alive again. He dies in St. Helena. Now, Nap we study Napoleon not because of his military battles, but because of the reforms that he did. Okay, Napoleon had a very big impact. For example, he really focused on creating a strong, centralized 
national government in France and all of Europe, in every, everywhere he conquered. Secondly, he impacted um, France by bringing the church back to France. Okay. And lastly, even though he had the Napoleonic Code, he used democracy to eliminate democracy. So he, he did repress people's rights and, and certain people. But that wasn't necessarily seen very well because everyone saw him as this great leader that brings stability back. Okay. Now, Napole after Napoleon, Europe is going to be changed greatly because of, of the elimination of the ancient regime, the elimination of the HRE. But in Unit 6 and 7, we're going to see the outcomes or uh, of Napoleon's changing of Europe. So this is Unit 5. Bye-bye.